Hi, Robert. Caroline, good day to you. And good day to you. And hi, everybody. Welcome to our four-part series on the Holy Journey. This is a class that we are both very excited about and inspired by Robert. I'm going to give him full credit for this because this came out of his soul. And I am honored that he asked me to do this class with him. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for wanting to do it with me. I think uh, a, a, a holy journey isn't something you get to do on your own or by yourself, is it? We need our companions. We need our friends. We need the supernatural aid that uh, Joseph Campbell talks about. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be doing this with you. You know, I have to say, I just want to comment on holy journey as we launch this. Yeah. And that's that I, I deeply believe that every single person um, would like to think their life is a holy journey in some way. And I say that because, I mean, at, this, at the core of wanting to uh, have purpose and meaning, of wanting your life to be more than just oxygen, is this, I think, deep and abiding soul need to feel that there's something sacred about the reason you are alive. Yeah. Do you know, Carolina, I think sometimes we have to be champions for certain words in the, in, in the English language or in any language. And to champion a word like holy or another one might be sacred, mm -hmm. I think is vital at this time. You know, one of the things I've been noticing is that um, the intellect likes to be able to define things. Mm. And when it can't define things, it cancels the word out of the language. Mm -hmm. So, for example, soul. Take a word like soul. I noted recently in the new revised standard version of the Bible of all places, they are taking away the word soul. Get and out. simply replacing it with the word life. Get out. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, OK, I get it. We don't we can't define the soul, but that doesn't mean we should stop talking about it. And um, and so similarly with holy and sacred, I think we have to champion these words and we have to be OK to be to not ever define them, but at least let's enjoy them and recognize them and celebrate the possibility that amongst all of this mess we suffer in life, there is something holy, there is something sacred. Do you know, that is one of the most terrifying things that I've ever heard. And mm. I'll tell you why. The absence of holy language in our vocabulary means that, I mean, if let's face it, if, if we took the word blue out of our vocabulary, eventually people would no longer be able to identify blue. Yeah. And when true. you take the word soul out or evil or sin or any of the words that are within the common parlance of what we might think of as holy vocabulary, we lose our capacity for really the, to, to spot what actually is a formidable force in our world, in the invisible world. We lose our capacity to navigate our own intuitive skills because we have taken away the vocabulary required to be a very adept intuitive. Yeah. It seems to me that, you know, the words that we won't use become our shadow in one way or another. So if we won't use the word sin anymore, then that becomes a shadow. But similarly, if we won't use the word holy or sacred, that also becomes our shadow in a sense. Uh, it, and and it, in a sense, it, well, we lose contact in a real sense with those words and what they can offer us and what they give us. But from another point of view, what is intimidating the collective hmm. that they don't want that word available? How has the collective been so intimidated that it's decided to dismantle the very core word that is, that houses our humanity, hmm. that houses the deeper instincts about what makes us respond compassionately with each other. 
and to each other. That's terrifying what you just said to me. It's mm -hmm. terrifying. Mm -hmm. I think it was bad enough that when I studied psychology, there was no soul in the curriculum, even though I think almost everybody knows that the word psyche means soul. So mm -hmm. in my studies, we had no soul, but lots of ology was the way I put it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was cognitive behavioral therapy, thoughts changing thoughts. But all of that was taking place more on what I would call the horizontal line of life. And I don't think you can change your life properly just on the horizontal line. You need that vertical. You need the mystery. You need the sacred and the holy to be able to create that true metanoia, which is one of the things we're going to look at on this journey, that fundamental shift. You can't be in control of a journey of transformation, can you? you? You have to allow yourself to be changed by it. And I think that includes being willing to inquire and investigate some of these words like holy. Well, you know, and think about the fact that the for me, my experience is that the majority of people who struggle with healing struggle with it because the vocabulary to get to why they're suffering is so inadequate. It does not address the fact that the wound, while their mind is, is dealing with wounded narratives and their heart may be dealing with wounded emotion, the depth of the wound is at the soul level. Mm. Betrayal is a soul wound. Mm. Humiliation is a soul wound. And when the mind comes in as an ally in that it provides a narrative of how to cope with it. But the wound is actually at soul level. Mm -hmm. And you need the vocabulary of the soul to heal that. Yeah. And I think um, we've called it a holy journey. We haven't called it a religious journey. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and um, this is a spiritual journey that we're exploring. Um, absolutely. But I think, yeah, it's it's up to each and every one of us to feel confident enough uh, to be able to claim words like holy and sacred and soul for ourselves and to know that really nobody has the authority to, to tell us not to use these words or even to define them for us. This is our own inner work. This is what we're about. And I think, and I'll let you go to take over this, but if you said to a human being, I'll give you a choice. Do you want to see your life as a holy journey or just your life? Mm. Which one do you want? And then we'll describe your life as it unfolds using the vocabulary, depending on your choice. So do mm -hmm. you want it filled with holy possibilities or do you just want a life that's whatever? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, Take it away, buddy. I will see you when you call me back in. Yeah. So everybody, the shape of this um, this um, first class is that um, we've begun together. I'm now going to do a little bit. Caroline will do a bit and then we'll come back together. And um, so in that sense, there's um, there's lots of inquiry here and also lots of conversation. I do hope you have got a uh, pen and paper ready because there will be some exercises uh, for you. This uh, it isn't just spiritual entertainment we're offering here. There's uh, some inner work to do here. And um, yeah, I think what I might do is um, start with a, a poem. And um, the purpose of this poem is simply to help us arrive and to be open and receptive to this uh, journey that we are on. I do just want to say, you know, life is, is so often, especially modern life, it's so manic, busy, hyperactive, so nonstop. The fact that we have all stopped and that we are together right now, I think is very, very significant. In fact, one of the things I would like you to consider is, isn't it interesting that on the journey of our life, it's often when we stop and we are still that actually something really good happens. 
And um, this stopping can be voluntary. Hopefully, like right now, we are volunteering to take this class together. Um, we volunteer, we choose to take the Sabbath, for example. We choose to take a break at lunchtime. We choose to take a yoga class. We choose to take a retreat. Um, so that's a voluntary stop. Or we may experience what I call an involuntary stop, which is where really life conspires in such a way as to make you stop. And uh, this can be all awfully um, difficult for us initially, uh, rather bewildering We can and, and annoying. None of us really like to stop when it's not our idea. Uh, but actually, I think most of us would be able to look at our life and say, well, here was one of those forced stops in my life that actually ended up being a really good thing. And it helped me to get clear on my journey, the journey of my life. And instead of being scattered into everydayness, that's a Martin Heidegger phrase. Instead of being scattered into everydayness, uh, because I stopped, I was able to make a meaningful contact with my soul, the essence of who I am. And I was able to be maybe more focused, uh, more open and receptive to guidance. And my journey started to become much more meaningful, less frantic, more fulfilled um, and, and more wonderful. So the poem that I want to share with you is um, topical for this time of year in the Northern Hemisphere. It's a poem that's called Snowdrops. And uh, I wrote Snowdrops when I was sitting on a wooden bench in the original garden in Findhorn up in northeast Scotland. So let's use this poem as, um, as a way of arriving and really saying yes to this journey together and being open and receptive to all good things. So this is Snowdrops. A small crowd of noble snowdrops has assembled in the corner of the garden. They are dressed in long green coats, standing to attention, their heads bowed. How did they get here? They were not here yesterday. Another crowd of snowdrops has gathered beneath the old oak tree. Where did they come from? What are they hoping to see? More crowds of snowdrops appear along the gravel path and by the garden gate. What are they waiting for? Why are they here? Have you noticed how they lean forward as if to get a better view. It's nearly spring. Something is happening, or it's about to. The snowdrops are quietly ushering in a new dawn. It's Candlemas time, some 40 days and 40 nights since the Christ child was born. What has been growing in the darkness will soon grow in the light. is called snowdrops and for me snowdrops are uh, a wonderful symbol of um, for new beginnings and for the expectancy uh, that comes with new beginnings we are waiting in expectancy we know that this is a time for new beginnings and new beginnings happen over and over again on the journey of our life. They can happen at any time of year, of course, but I think they especially happen at this time of year. And uh, for us, I think the great work is to ask ourselves every now and then, what is the new beginning that I am attending to in my life at this time? Can I identify the new story that is emerging in me at this time? Am I aware of a new interest that's really got my attention? There's a conversation I wanna be part of. There's a, a topic of interest that is holding my interest and I really wanna know about it. In fact, I can't wait until I can do a little bit more research about this particular topic that has my interest right now. 
So this is uh, new beginnings, new beginnings for a holy journey. I want to just really um, pick up again on where we began here um, and to encourage each and, other, each and every one of us to embrace the idea that life is sacred and um, how important it is for us to be willing to embrace the sacred. Just to live is a blessing. Just to live is holy, um, said Rabbi Heschel. And, uh, you know, it can be very difficult to hold on to that experience of the sacred, especially when we have such busy lifestyles. You know, we, our lifestyles are manic, busy, hyperactive. And um, this busyness, one of the effects of it is that I think uh, we lose conscious connection with our soul and not just with our soul, but also with the wisdom of our body. For example, do you have, is your body giving you a message right now that you are overriding and ignoring? We uh, lose contact with the wisdom of our heart. I like to think of the heart as a, a mailbox uh, in which a, every day the soul drops a love letter into the mailbox. And if you visit your heart, there will be a message there for you. We don't pay attention to what really inspires us. We promise ourselves that we'll get around to it eventually when we're less busy. But whenever are we less busy? So, you know, to be able to really uh, claim the word sacred and holy is really, really uh, important. And for us to really treasure the idea that uh, life can be sacred, even, even though it's very, very difficult at times, very, very challenging. Um, everything is holy if we see it uh, in a certain way. And one thing I think for sure, and I was actually just um, on a conference recently where um, we were looking at um, how we're going to tackle climate change in a really effective way. Um, one of the major findings of this climate change was that it's not information that's going to save us. We already have enough information about what's happening uh, on the planet. So we don't need more information as such right now. Um, actually, if we're really going to save ourselves, what we need is to recover the sense of the sacred. We need to be able to look at a, at a tree and, and experience it as being sacred, as being holy, as being beautiful, as being amazing. And um, to do that, we must be in contact with our heart and we must be willing to accept that somehow we are um, sacred and holy too, as much as everybody else is. So, yes, we're on a journey. Our life is a journey. And this time around, uh, Caroline and I are very much um, uh, going for the idea that it's a holy journey. And the first thing I would like you to do is to complete this sentence with me. One way I experience the journey of my life as holy is, okay? One way I experience the journey of my life as holy is. And I'd like you just to complete the sentence as I say it to you five more times. One way I experience the journey of my life as holy is. Another way I experience the journey of my life as holy is. Another way I experience the journey of my life as holy is. I'm going to give it to you two more times. And remember, we're not being religious here. We're being grateful. 
we're being spiritual, we're being open, we're being receptive, we're allowing ourselves to be in awe of the miracle of everything that is ordinary and familiar to us. So another way that I experience the journey of my life as holy is, and one more time, another way I experience the journey of my life as holy is, My wife, Holly, um, has a poem called Where I Belong. Maybe I'll read it at some point on, on this journey of ours. <clears throat> um, but in that uh, poem of hers, there's a wonderful line where she talks about the holy church of noticing. And um, I think often when it comes to taking journeys, really, um, it's not about uh, new landscapes, so to speak. It's more about uh, new eyes, a new way of seeing things. And so hopefully on this journey of ours, we can go to the Holy Church of Noticing, which, by the way, um, happens under the canvas of a blue sky um, and not in some building somewhere. Um, it's everywhere you go and everywhere you are that's the holy church of noticing it's what you bring to the experience that really matters if somebody was to ask you what is the journey of your life what would you say if you were asked to sum up the journey of your life in just say 20 words what would you say we all know we're on a journey don't we being on a journey feels meaningful to us right from the beginning right when we were young we were introduced to wonderful stories about journeys um even recently my son christopher played the part of gilgamesh um in his uh, school play he's he's just 12 and um my daughter Bo has been studying the odyssey so we know about these journeys they they are um they're part of the narrative of what it is to be a human. We're all on a journey. How would you describe the journey of your life? When I think back, I can identify some different stories um, that I learned to articulate um, only by being sort of fully in them um, as a as a young psychologist, somebody who had studied psychology and philosophy and was was uh, working um, in a clinic on mental wellness and um, and on mental health, you know, I came up with the idea to create the Happiness Project. And the journey of working with the Happiness Project, which is a project that I, I began on the National Health Service here in the UK, that project became a journey for me and I ended up taking people on journeys the journey was an eight-week happiness program and um, for me the journey of the happiness project was to make a shift from searching for happiness to following my joy I think there's a world of difference between searching for happiness and following your joy so for me the journey around happiness had always been searching for happiness. I was always searching for something somewhere. But of course, in searching for happiness, I placed happiness outside of myself. It wasn't where I was. It was somewhere else. And hence, my lifestyle was manic, busy, hyperactive. I was suffering from what I later called uh, destination addiction, hoping to arrive somewhere else other than where I am right now in the hopes that I'd be happy. When I made the shift from searching for happiness to following my joy, oh, I was so different. Now, all of a sudden, I wasn't chasing something. Now I was engaged in what Caroline calls holy listening. I was paying attention to myself and I was connecting with that joy spark that I believe is in each and every one of us and that we are all of us called to follow that joy.
actually. That is the great work of our life, at least in part, is to follow our joy. That was one of the first journeys I went on. Uh, I created a, a, a bespoke consultancy called Success Intelligence. This was when I was around 35, just after I had been forced to stop. I was 35 years old. I was racing through my life and I got this itch at the base of my back that just wasn't going away. I'd wake up a bit stiff in the morning, a bit awkward, didn't quite know how to move, but I just kept going. I wasn't listening to my body. I had places to be, um, places to get to. After a while, that itch turned into more of a, like a sting. It was a stinging sensation. And even then I didn't stop. I had some really important work to do at the time. I was engaged in some great work down at the body shop, uh, not far from here. I was doing some leadership work with another company I really enjoyed working with. And I was just too full. My schedule was too packed and I wasn't gonna stop, so I didn't. And then eventually, one day after um, I'd finished a lecture, literally as I'd finished the lecture, I actually bent down to pick up a pencil that had rolled off the tabletop. I couldn't pick it up, I couldn't bend down. I literally, my body seized up and I had to stop. And for the next six months, I had a walking stick um, which I became very attached to, by the way. That walking stick became a good friend to me. And um, initially, of course, I didn't like the idea of slowing down, not for a moment. But eventually I did get the hang of it. And it was in stopping that a space appeared in my life, a space for conversations that I would otherwise have been too busy to have. A space appeared for me to meet up with people that I would not have met up with ordinarily because I'd have been too busy again. But I got the hang of it. And in that time, I was able to rethink, in particular, my relationship to success. And I created a company called Success Intelligence. And really, the journey of Success Intelligence was firstly to create new definitions of success that were better for us as individuals, but also better for the planet. And I would sum up the whole of my work with success intelligence as a journey from success to real success. I'll give you one more example of a, of a journey, and that would be the work that I did with another project called Lovability. And um, with lovability, I was really looking at the psychology and the spirituality of love, which was something actually that Caroline helped me with very much and was very supportive of, um, of my efforts. And um, with this particular project, I basically I saw that my destiny was not to find love, my destiny was to become the most loving person that I could be. So I made a switch from searching to being. The thing that I was searching for, I was being called to be. And uh, actually, I realized that the more loving I could be as a person, the more I would find love in my life. I would experience love in my life. So these are some examples from me of uh, journeys that I feel I've been on in my life. Um, I, I think the journey from, from persona to psyche is another journey that I've taken particularly with the Enneagram. And you may be aware that Caroline and I have run three major programs now on uh, the work of the Enneagram. The Enneagram is um, a Greek model, a model of nine personality types. The journey with the Enneagram is to be less persona orientated and more psyche centered, shall we say. It's a journey from ego to soul. It's a journey from Jesus to Christ. It's a journey from Siddhartha to Buddha. It's a journey from Arjuna to Krishna consciousness. All of these journeys um have been very very meaningful to me how about you what it, would you say is the journey of your life so my next um invitation to you is to see if you can uh 
describe the journey of your life in, let's say, if you like, you could do it in a hundred words or less. If you were to give a title to the journey of your life, what would you what would you give that? Um, one of my books uh, is is called Finding Love Everywhere. Sixty seven and a half wisdom poems to help you be the love you're looking for. And um, so Finding Love Everywhere, that felt like a good title for me, for my journey. But how about you? What would be the title of the journey of your life? Yeah. With every journey, there is um, the need for a beginning. And in that beginning, there is um, often a sense that we um, need to purge, to cleanse, to fast, to empty our cupboards, to empty our drawers, and to make space for something new. You can't tell the old story and the new story at the same time. At some point, we have to be willing to um, empty ourselves. In, in mysticism, this is the practice of kenosis. And this is what we do often at the beginning of uh, various journeys. And indeed, this is the invitation, for example, of Lent at the moment. Um, we are right in the middle of, of Lent. And here at Lent, we are being asked to really choose the power of spirit, if you like, over matter. And so the invitation at the moment is to clear a space. And you've done that already by choosing to be on this program. Um, and that's a fine thing. But how else could you be making a space so as to invite um, the holy journey into your awareness more fully right now? Sometimes we make that space by managing our pace, by changing the pace of our life in one way or another. Um, another way we do it is by making a sacrifice. And this is the last thing I'd like to share with you before I ask Caroline to come in. At some point when we take the holy journey, we will have to be willing to let go of something and um, to make a sacrifice. Um, I think it's important to recognize that there are healthy sacrifices and underhealthy sacrifices. An unhealthy sacrifice, I think, is depriving your, yourself of something you enjoy, doing it out of guilt and hoping for a favorable judgment from a wrathful God. A healthy sacrifice is about giving up and letting go of something that isn't working well for you and it isn't really healthy and you're happy to sacrifice it so that you can experience more aliveness and a greater sense of the sacred and the holy and indeed even more of God's love. And so I thought I would share with you one more practice for now, which is um, making a healthy sacrifice where you can let go of something so as to make room for a new beginning and the start of this wonderful holy journey that each and every one of us are are on for always and in, in one of my recent newsletters I I offered a practice on uh, making an making a healthy sacrifice for Lent and I invited everybody to share some ideas of what a healthy sacrifice for Lent might look like and so these uh, sacrifices that I'm going to share with you now I've got a list of them that were given to me by um, people who did this exercise, you know, we're not talking about giving up chocolate so that you can fit into your genes. Um, fitting into your genes isn't going to really change your life. Yeah. It's when you make a, a true sacrifice, a sacrifice of something that isn't working for you, uh, that isn't healthy for something that is wondrous and and uh, offers great possibilities. That's when we change our life for the better. So here's an ex here's a list of some of the um, healthy sacrifice people said they would like to make for Lent. Um, giving up trying to be normal because it doesn't work anyway, and you didn't come here to be normal. Removing the word should from my vocabulary. To stop depriving myself of my true needs. 
handing in my super mum badge, giving up foods that don't love my body, stop making excuses for not doing things that I like, letting go of an old grievance, giving up chronic busyness for true success, no more skipping or shortening my spiritual practice, giving up my unhealthy self-reliance, I call that dysfunctional independence, to stop neglecting the health of my body, to release the need to please everyone, to shorten my to-do list each day, to give up future happiness for happiness now, to surrender one of my defenses for greater intimacy, to stop waiting for the perfect person to arrive and to procrastinate less and live more. We have to be willing to give up something unholy for something holy if we are going to take the holy journey of our life. And on that note, I'm going to pause and invite Caroline back in. Lovely. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. I'm going to pick up on a theme, which is, um, I, I, I think I'll be begin by just sharing that uh, I had a, I spent a brief time, very brief, much too brief time on the Camino, the sacred walk in Spain. And I had the, um, experience the insight uh, the Camino goes through <clears throat> you know the forest and then it goes on, on to a thousand mile walk and it's it's very old and um, it's a thousand year walk it's a thousand years old and it's 800 miles so I'm getting my facts missed but I'll get it straight at any rate it's a long walk and the path goes through cities and towns and the forests and here and there and and here's what happened. Here's what I, it's a holy journey to walk the Camino. It's, it's a physical holy journey. And Martin Sheen did a great movie on it called The Way. So, I mean, I, I, it's just worth watching. When you are walking the Camino, what I discovered was you're on a path that and everybody's walking to the same destination. Everybody, every single person is walking the same way on the same destination. And we all know where we're going and we all know we're on a holy journey. And, and so it's a, everybody knows that. And, and the amazing thing is picture a sidewalk in your town that happens to be inclusive of the, in the Camino. And, um, and here's the street. And the street's not part of the Camino. The Camino is just a narrow path and it's just on the sidewalk. But everyone on the sidewalk is walking towards St. James. And so they greet each other and it's, you know, go with God and, 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 and a blessed Camino to you. And, and, and when you sit down, for example, you sit down uh, at a cafe, everyone starts talking. Where are you from? What are you doing? What's your journey? What's your experience? What are you here for? The openness is unbelievable. The heart-centeredness, the, the um, nature of this journey is so extraordinary. And what I did was when, when the part of the Camino we were walking was in a town, we're walking on the sidewalk. And I stepped off the sidewalk onto the street, just one step. But on the street, people were going this way and that way. And I immediately felt that I couldn't greet them in the same way that I could as soon as I walked back on the Camino. And, and even people who were walking on the sidewalk who weren't actually pilgrims on the Camino understood that it was the Camino, and so they participated in the greetings. But as soon as I stepped off, I was in ordinary space. And as soon as I stepped on, I was in this tunnel of grace where everybody 
just had a sense of I could trust this person. This person won't harm me. I just the atm the the atmosphere of grace was palpable. I'm telling you, it was palpable. And the number of people that I've met who said I've got to get back to the Camino. This is my fourth walk. This is my fourth sixth walk. They had to get back. And what I realized is they had to get back to that sensation to that sensation that I'm actually on a holy journey. I have to feel it. I, I, I'm feeling for the first time, I'm feeling like something <clears throat> sacred can actually be experienced in the world. That it's not just an idea that I have to keep alive in my head, a, 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 a mental goal that we describe in our um, uh, theology in our in our in our lectures, you know, a, a, a hope that's floating around in the heavens, but that somehow I could actually experience what it would be like to be on a journey, however temporary, that in fact allowed me to open to take down the patterns of fear and to experience instead the flow of humanity in me, the flow of what it is like to feel, and here's the operative word, to feel like I am on the right path, to feel like I'm on a genuine path, to feel like I am walking with other human beings that I'm not judging, that, that my initial response to all the people around me is not to pull back, but to be open. And that's a whole different use of your heart muscle. It's a whole different use of your instincts. It's a whole different programming. And here's where I want to go with this. That programming is one that says, I'm, I'm moving toward the whole. This is what the whole feels like. This is what it feels like to be part of a bio-spiritual ecology system in which I am one with the whole instead of constantly separating myself from the whole by saying, I must be recognized. I must be special. I must be extraordinary. I must be this. Separating yourself from the whole is an enormous psychic burden. And it is contra to the organization of nature. And when, for me, the journey of, of the holy journey begins, when you actually get the truth that everything we do needs to bring us to the whole, needs to consider the whole needs to you be to be uh, you need to understand you are part of the whole you are everything you do impacts the whole and the whole impacts you and i and when i was on the camino i experienced that i actually thought this is what it feels like to I mean, I, I think of that one person I just sat down and he said, do you want to share my orange? People just pulled out food. Do you want to share this? Do you want to share a cup of coffee? Do you want to, you, you sat at little cafes on the Camino and people didn't feel awkward saying, do you mind if I sit down with you? It was understood. Everything was, was there. I mean, it was open. It, the barriers that we put up in order to declare our private space in order to protect ourselves, because off the Camino, symbolically and literally, off the path of holism, we we feel like we have to um, somehow or other fight for recognition. And imagine if you're a cell in your body, a cell that's screaming, you got to recognize me. You got to recognize me or I'm going to step out of line here. And if you step out of line, you become a cancer cell. You become a mutant cell. You become a psychic free radical. I mean, you, you, you become a free radical in the body and then a psychic free radical. You, you separating yourself from the whole is one of the great errors that we somehow support in our, in our um, 
and the way we look at life, that somehow this quest for individualism is so extreme that um, imagine if every single human being in this world craved a spotlight and got a spotlight, you'd be blinded. You'd be blinded. The, the point is not to separate yourself from the whole, but to realize I am part of this and how best do my, my talents, my skills, my life's journey support the whole of this journey of life that I am on. We ask the wrong questions when we say, what, what's just my purpose, my, 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 my. That word is so lethal, I think. I think when you start asking questions like, what is the purpose of life? Get my out of it. And just say, what's the purpose of life and how does my life fit into that? Ask that question. How can I serve the purpose of life? How can I serve? And, and think about how you make your decisions. And, and when you think of your life journey, one of the questions I would ask you to, to reflect upon, because that's one of my favorite words is reflection, is how much of your own pain and suffering has come from the need for recognition or has come from, from feeling like, from decisions that are self-motivated in ways that have been attention-driven. I don't know how else to ask this. Instead of saying, I, I, in exclusive of others, instead of inclusive. You know, I honestly, and I've taught it before, and it's something that I believe more with every passing day, that all of us are on the same journey, essentially the same Camino. And that's that we're, the, the true holy journey is that we are all here to go from our struggle with the love of power in this world to actually releasing the power of love within us. That this is the journey. This, this is the journey. We all have the same task. We are all tasked. Our lives look differently, and we will all live that journey differently, but the journey is identical. And the power that we possess inside of ourselves to make a difference in this world, no matter how small your world is, no matter how cluttered it is, the enormous amount of power that you have within yourself to make a difference in this world is incalculable. And I, I honestly believe it begins with someone, with you deciding, I think that I will see my life as holy. I will. I, I'm just going to try it out. I'm going to try it out. I'm going to see how that works. Put that word in your head. And just see, how would that change things if you saw your life as sacred or holy? If you decided, this is my life's no accident. And, and, and in keeping with that, because you see your life as sacred, there is a whole package deal that comes with that. And that's that it's as difficult as it may be to think about guidance and the invisible world. Here's what's truth. Truth. That I want you to look at nature. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and I want you to think, what is the nature of God? God is exactly like nature. Just like nature. The nature of God is like the laws of nature. And, and like the systems of nature and every single system, every single, everything has purpose. It has its function and it is not here by accident. And the same thing is true with you. You're not here by accident. And it's been my experience that people oftentimes reduce the purpose of their life to productivity, 
If I'm not producing something, I have a purposeless life. What am I, sh where's my work? What, what should I be producing, producing, producing? But the truth is the purpose in life is what is it I have come to give, not to take? Whose lives can I change? How do I make this world a better place? And, and it may incorporate all your skills and your talents, and that may open who knows what to you. But when you shift to thinking, I think my life is a very blessed, holy journey. And every day is an opportunity for me to do something good, no matter how big or how small, for the whole. Because whatever I do to one is done to all. Change how you do the calculations of your power. Instead of thinking that your power is measured by ordinary earth standards, like if I'm not productive and I'm not earning, I'm not, do, I'm not worth anything. Instead of that measurement, use holy calculations, holy mathematics, mystical math, as I would call it. And that's that whatever I do to one, is done to everybody. If I'm kind to one person today, it's kindness all over the place. If I'm thoughtful to one person, it's thought all over the place. Start doing mystical mathematics. Start seeing your life as holy. And if you did, you'd think, how would I do, how do I make this decision given that I believe my life to be sacred? How, how would I now, and that the lives of everyone else their lives are as sacred as mine. That this is the journey we are all sharing together at this time. There are so many times, I tell you something, I'm, I'm a history freak. I just adore history. What if, you, if I'm not here at this desk, I'm reading history somewhere, or watching history or whatever. And, I, and I, I so often imagine what it would have been like to live at this time or this time and any time I'm studying some era, I somehow find myself just wanting to, like literally absorbing that time zone and, and thinking of myself like in the Middle Ages or in the Shakespearean times or in Russian history or wherever it is I travel when I read history. And then I think that being alive now Someday they'll be writing about this time and I'll be gone. And they, what will they say about us now? Because as you look back in history, one of the reasons I love history so much is because it offers you this perspective of what new thoughts were making their way into human consciousness, what new perceptions and the power of those thoughts that were then shifting evolution and shifting the way people then changed <clears throat> their societies. Like the way the humanism era began to inspire people to think, you know, maybe, maybe human beings were born with fundamental spiritual rights, which of course led to the constitution, led to the United States. But in the moment that those thoughts came in, through John Locke, through Rousseau, through these writers, through those philosophers, you could not have imagined all that would change. You need history to, you need years, centuries to come by and look back. What is happening now, like those profound truths that came in in various times in our history, is that we are on a journey toward understanding the power of holism. We are being called to that. This is a collective journey we're on. And that in each of our lives is this lesson, this truth, this impulse, that our lives, we, if you want to go with the flow, you go with the flow of what will make me whole and what will increase the whole of others, the whole, the health of the whole. 
I have to think of myself now as a micro, a bio-spiritual micro-earth. And how I manage the life on my earth is my contribution to the collective earth. To me, that is the essence of the contemporary mystical journey. Our transition from thinking that we are a a, a rogue cell in this body of life to getting that if the healthier I am as a cell in my body and in the cell of life, that's the greatest contribution I can make to the whole. That is our collective holy journey. Robert. Thank you, Caroline. Oh, it's it's riveting. I'm I'm literally just I was just feeling like the molecules in my body just like rearranging themselves. <laughs> it was a really great feeling. It was just like just to open up the journey again by acknowledging the sense of the holy. Mm-hmm. Feels so important. Um, I wonder if we could just take a moment just to to examine again like what is what is the what are the potential benefits of genuinely naming our journey as a holy journey well i i think for me um of course i see my life as a holy journey and i have for some time so i think of because i see my life as a holy journey i expect guidance to flow in. I expect grace to flow in. And I expect myself to respond to others with that same thing, with those same elements, to have grace in my heart for others. I expect, and I expect more of myself, I think, Robert, in that I don't really allow myself to um be as to be as disappointed as i once was when i was a younger woman mm-hmm. to expect i don't have the expectations anymore i have gratitude but i don't have expectations i don't have that kind of um attitude i have this sense that i co-create that i'm directed and that um, I work with the holy tools, okay? One yeah. of which is holy listening, which is why we've listed that. And I yeah. we should talk about that. Yeah. So, so for me, I actually utilize the tools of heaven. Hmm. Yeah, I do. I do. Can I ask you more about that? The tools of heaven? Yeah. 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 Well, 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 for me, in my little tool chest, for example... I, I, I really do turn to prayer a great deal. Mm. All right. I, I turn to prayer a great deal. I also have an understanding that God doesn't cover stupid and God doesn't no, And God doesn't cover lazy. I mean, I know that the invisible world, the nature of the divine is very much like the nature of nature and that we are given we are very we are given tasks here okay and i know that heaven will not do for us what we can do for ourselves mm-hmm. heaven will not do that it doesn't step in to make a task we are meant to do and that task is to hear that word you're going to automatically assume it's external but a task is also I apply that word to an awakening. Yeah. I have to awaken to something. Mm -hmm. I have to learn something. I have to, to have more. I have to understand something more deeply. That is also a task. And in these inner tasks that then turn me into a very different kind of person, I will make different choices because I've excavated myself more deeply excavations are our 
tasks. Okay. So what I, what I know heaven does is it provides grace to do those excavations in the form of, for example, you, I become unsettled, which tells me something's not finished. Mm -hmm. I become incredibly unsettled. I, I, be, I assume if I say I need some guidance with this and my prayer at the end of the day is this is what I've done today. This is what I need. You get the night shift. I get the day shift. And I really do release to heaven what I cannot settle myself. I don't know how to work this out. I don't know what to do here. So you figure it out and let me know in the morning. Okay. So I really live by that. I really, really, really live by that. And I, I, I assume that every, I have to live by knowing that every person I meet, every person I see, I, I honestly do not judge. I work to not judge. And if, and if a judgment flows out of me because that's a knee-jerk reaction, I immediately follow it with a prayer. And I try and live in that space because I truly believe we are that closely watched, that the universe is two things. It is completely impersonal and totally intimate. And both are true. Mm -hmm. So it, it, so that's part of the, the mystical way I, I understand everything. Yeah. I just live in that world. Yeah. And, and in order to access the atmosphere of grace that you talk about and, and the sense of the holy, um, what's, what would you say to us about you know, it seems to me like we often come up with these qualifications that we need in order to do that, you know, like a theology degree or a perfect past or do you know what I mean? Like, how did you how did you get the hang of the idea that holiness was available to you? It never occurred to me that it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, And I think it's because I didn't go through education. It just never occurred yeah. to me that I wasn't. I. Mm. It never occurred to me, Robert. I, yeah. I grew up feeling like I was in a holy bubble, and I mm -hmm. never left it. Wow! Yeah. And, and actually, I went. I went in my spiritual director. I said, "I got to get out of this thing because mm -hmm. I can't, I don't feel like I can t touch physical life very easily." Yeah. You know, I I and I find people, human beings, put too many words. They get too intellectually congested, mm -hmm. and 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 it's the, the nature of the God is uh, to reach God is action. It's not words. It's action. It's action. Heaven is interested not in you getting attention, but in what your intention is. Heaven pays attention to your intention. That is what matters. It, it's because from that comes the acts of creation. And that's what creates the world we're in. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you that our greatest handicap to recognizing the holiness of our journeys is our own arrogance. The idea that, you know, we can intellectualize God, that we can, we can now, you know, just, we can intellectualize love and God and this. All of that's nonsense. It's all about what are you actually doing? Mm. What are you actually doing? And get out of yourself. Stop thinking that your spiritual path is about you. But what I, I noticed the list, nobody said anything on that list about service to others. Mm. Nobody said anything about reaching out to someone else, about putting someone else. What where was that? Where were those choices? You know, it's about these are the choices yeah. that bring someone into the whole and realize, I, you know what? I do better when I breathe with others. Yeah, I love that. I think I consider myself very fortunate in that I didn't have to undo any religious conditioning 
you know I grew up in a in a family where we we weren't religious we were just busy we were fighting essentially against poverty uh, so there was no there was no religion in in my upbringing and then actually when I started to get interested in religion I was introduced to religion via mystics which I will be forever grateful for mm -hmm. because I felt like you know there were these sometimes you know I get this sense of these two doors and one door says um, lecture on God and the other one says have an experience of God and um, you know sometimes I think you know you can get so caught up on the lecture on God that you never get to experience God ever you never get to experience the holy ever I was just so lucky really and blessed to have been given the the confidence to know that actually I could accept access these things naturally yeah. just naturally absolutely I wanted to hear your comment on the invitation of Lent. Yeah. Well, I think for me, again, for me, the invitation of Lent is to make the sacrifice, in a sense, in the context of what we're talking about, sacrificing the unholy for the holy. Mm -hmm. It is to recognize, well, what isn't working for me in my life, like being obsessed with my purpose, rather than a shared purpose of humanity. For example, I would say, you know, it is being willing to look at our life and see where it isn't working for us and then being able to make some holy choices. For example, you know, I think that one of the things that I already love about this program we're on and as I was beginning to prepare for it even in my, I had, a, you know, you get that feeling in your body that a preparation's happening whether you're thinking about it or not it's one of the great joys of, of teaching actually um was that for me just to invoke the word holy means i'm more present in my life and less and less insanely busy mm -hmm. uh, i'm more present rather than being productive the whole time like you're talking about you know when you shared that with me recently you know it really hit me you undid me right there because I realized, yeah, I'm in a productive time right now and I'm producing, producing, producing. And I think I'm allowed to do that for a little bit, but I also get there's a time coming where I'm going, where the field will be fallow and I'm really meant to rest in God and, you know, and do that and not make productivity a habit. So maybe sometimes sacrificing productivity for being truly present, for example, would be another way of looking at it. So that's, that's a few ways I see the invitation of Lent. We're not doing it to, to please God. I think we're doing it to experience God. You know, I have a very close friend, a very, very close friend who's Muslim. And we talked about Ramadan mm -hmm. and the fasting. And he says, I look forward to Ramadan every year and fasting. And I said, how do you go without food all day like that? Because that for me would be... Mm -hmm. But he said, oh, he said, no. He said, I, I look at that of going completely without food or water. He doesn't have anything. He honors it completely. And he said, and when I start feeling hungry, which I do, mm -hmm. he said, now I know what hungry people feel like. And I will do what I can for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. He says, now I know. He says, because now it brings me into their life in a way that everything else can't. Yeah. I will never forget that. No, it's beautiful. And so, and so now I fast once a week. Mm -hmm. Because Do of him. Yes. Really? Yeah. Because of him. Because of him. Yeah. And, and, and so when I say, like, what makes my life holy? Mm -hmm. what, how do I want to do that? I, I, I really... The nights that I, I I stay up praying for the for people in in Ukraine and for this war and for this world, I I see myself in Ukraine, standing there in 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 the town praying for the people as mm. if delivering prayers, delivering prayers, delivering prayers. I for me, I, you know, to make your life a holy journey means to live it, mm. to put into your life 
holy practices, however it is you see them, however yeah. it is you define what holy is, that is a notch above ordinary, mm -hmm. that benefits others as much as or more than you. Yeah. That what you can do, and when I say holy toolbox, this to me, I am trying to live the truths that we are all connected. Yeah. And if we're all connected and there's a power in prayer and grace, then I'm going to use that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to use that. And all of a sudden, Lent becomes far more interesting now. You know, that's exciting hearing you talk about Lent like that. I mean, I'm just thinking of a, a story, recent story as well. I'm coaching somebody. He lives in Egypt um, and he he works for a company. It's a so it's a leadership program that I'm taking. And um, and he 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 told me that uh, Ramadan, he likes to to give up chocolate. So we've all heard about giving up chocolate. But he said to me, I do it so that I can taste the sweetness of life more fully. Mm -hmm. And he started to tell me about how he notices that if he just reaches for the chocolate, it's often a sign that he's not in contact with that sweetness. Now, he's got a, a whole Sufi thing going on here as well. So add in, you know, this is sweetness with a capital S. This is this is tasting life. Yes, it's missing spirit, mm -hmm. isn't it? This is something else. And now all of a sudden, why wouldn't we want to do that? That's exciting. Mm -hmm. That's now starting to sound holy. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think this is the thing where we, for me, the invitation of, of, of Lent is we've, we've just got to claim these things back and not be told how to do them, but, but do the holy listening and even ask your soul, what is the invitation of Lent this year for me? Well, you know, I think and, and I, I, I think that why what I'm reminded of all the time when we do a class like this is that these these practices, these rituals, whether it's Lent or Ramadan, or um, they come, they're, they're a couple of thousand years old. These aren't new. Yeah. And there's a reason they have been honored and mm -hmm. haven't fallen by the wayside because they're, they are soul level rituals. Mm -hmm. and, and it's when you understand them at the soul level that you really appreciate their power to make a difference in your life, to, to bring you to a different place. It's not about giving up something or just, you know, silly rules. They're not. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's kind of like reading the scripture. If you just look at it like that's just an old book, but if your soul reads it, yeah, it reveals something to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a quality we have to bring to these things, isn't it? And, yes. um, you know, this morning I was I was reading up on Martin Buber um, and writing a particular piece on the Enneagram right now. And there were two things I made a note of just to um, that I thought I would bring into our conversation possibly today. Um, the two points that Martin Buber, the philosopher, made. And remember, Martin Buber is this person who gave us the I, the I, thou relationship. Mm -hmm. And he said, all journeys have secret destinations of which the traveler is unaware. Mm -hmm. I really like that. I like the sense that, you know, that the holy offers us surprises if we're open to it. But he also said this, he said, everyone must come out of his exile in his own way. And um, I think certainly listening in particular to you, um, today, Caroline, this sense of if we are to be on a holy journey, we must come out of our exile. This sense of living an individual life, a separate life with a separate purpose and a separate destination and a separate reason for traveling. We've got to be willing to come out of that exile and, and somehow acknowledge that we're all on uh, the same journey, each of us doing it in our own way, but it is the same journey. I love that. Yeah. 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 And with that, I want to, I would like to, to close our first wonderful session by speaking just for a moment on the power of holy listening. Mm -hmm. Please. And that's that, you know, holy listening, it, what that means is, you know, when you, when you 
go into yourself, you're going to hear a lot of chaos and you're going to hear your own mind and you're going to hear all your words and all of that other stuff. And you have to get through that. And what holy listening for me is, is that I will um, release a prayer. For example, I need some help with this. And I let it go like a hot air balloon. And I know I'm going to get an answer. And so I get about my day. I get about my day. And every now and again during the day, I'll stop and take a deep breath and think, is there anything coming down? Is there anything out there? And I wait and see what's going on in myself and what occurs to me. I want to listen for something other than my own thoughts. Mm. I want to listen. And the way I would compare it, and I just I just wrote this up this morning because I'm writing a, new, a, a, a brand new forward to one of my books. That the way grace comes in, I want you to think of yourself in a smoky bar. You're in a very smoky bar. And you don't realize that the smoke in the crowd is getting bad for you. Because you, it's like, what do you call that? The frog boiling in the water. You don't even realize. Mm. Then all of a sudden, you get a whiff of fresh air. Just out of the clear blue. You didn't ask for it. You didn't say, well, someone please open a window. Because you you're not even aware of fresh air. But all of a sudden, this fresh air hits you and you go, and you think, oh, my God. And that's all it takes to inspire the next step, which is, I got to get out of here. I can't stand this. This is so smoky. It's so off. I can't breathe in here. All That's all it took was one little breath of grace. And you, and you pack up your belongings and you get out. And you may never have thought, wow. I was, I was just hit with a lightning bolt of grace. You, you'll never think, but what you will always remember, and you'll tell the story, that I was sitting in this smoky bar, and then all of a sudden, honestly, I got one breath of fresh air, and man, I was out. Mm. You'll always remember that. You may never say that that was grace, but you'll always remember that. And that's how grace works. It comes in. It's like a breath of fresh air, and it causes you to make a positive choice, however small, even if it's just leaving the room, but you'll always remember it. And holy listening is like that breath of fresh air that comes in that isn't quite that smoky, crowded thought congestion in your, it's just a little bit fresher. Mm. I love that. Brilliant. All right, we've begun. We've begun. This was our new beginning, and um, and I I trust that we've laid down some good foundations here. We've opened up the invitations. There are some wonderful inquiries in here. So uh, I look forward to to the second class, the holy shift. The holy shift from the holy journey to the holy shift. How about it? <laughs> Great. You got it. Thank you, yeah. everybody. Thank you, everybody. See you for class two. Yeah.